<clears throat> testing. 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 I think we're good. Testing. Get this stream started. Alrighty. Um, welcome back to another stream here. Today we are looking at uh, a paper and a GitHub repo for X decoder. This is a uh, generalized decoding for pixel image and language. Um, has a bunch of state-of-the-art uh, badges here and it's work relatively recent work here coming out of um, I mean out just earlier I think is it less than a week old yeah right around a week old and it's coming out of Microsoft research um, Microsoft cloud and AI so I guess a different kind of branch of Microsoft there and as well as two universities here, University of Wisconsin-Madison, UCLA. There's a lot of weird little asterisk things here. So they have a star for equal technical contribution. So you have these three people here. You have the little paragraph symbol for equal advisory contribution. So these two guys here. And then you have uh, the little spades sign for the project lead who is here. So, yeah, maybe a little overboard on all the different um, symbols, but cool to see. So, got a pretty image here. And with one suite of parameters, X decoder after pre training supports all types of image segmentation tax, tasks. Uh, ranging from open vocabulary instance semantic panoptic segmenta segmentation to referring segmentation and vision language tasks including image text retrieval and image captioning labeled in green boxes it further empowers composite tasks like referring captioning using X decoder itself and image editing that combines with generative models such as stable diffusion labeled in yellow boxes so Basically, it's like segmentation on steroids. You have every type of segmentation, especially types of segmentation that um, are kind of open-ended, where you can kind of choose your own vocabulary uh, using like a language uh, model. So expecting there to be probably clip somewhere in this, if I had to guess. You know, the clip is our contrastive language Image pre-training, it's our favorite uh, joint image and language encoder. Um, so you have here segmentation, bounding box, you even have uh, image editing. So I guess this is the original um, picture of the apples with the table and then they segment out the apples and then they change the table to a plate, which is kind of cool. And the open vocabulary segmentation is actually probably the most interesting where you can actually, I'm assuming this is what this means, we'll have to dig in deeper, but I'm assuming you can just literally define your categories at inference time and it'll go ahead and segment those. Um, okay, so X decoder, generalized decoding model that can predict pixel level segmentation and language tokens seamlessly. Okay, keyword there, seamlessly. I wonder if that's an inside joke on the fact that this is a segmentation paper and there's seams in segmentations. So X decoder takes us input two types of queries, generic non-semantic queries and semantic queries induced from text inputs. To decode different pixel level and token level outputs in the same semantic space. So this is a unified way to support all types of Im image segmentation and vision language tasks. A rich pixel level visual semantic understanding space. 
without any pseudo labeling. Millions of image text pairs. Okay, so we're gonna switch to our data set color here and this is part, they're kind of hinting at what it's been trained on, a mixed set of a limited amount of segmentation data and millions of image text pairs. So coming out of Microsoft, I think the original uh, Coco data set is from Microsoft. Coco data set. Um, Coco data set Wikipedia. MS Coco, yeah, I think the MS actually stands for Microsoft. So I think Microsoft has a, a good data set. They obviously have something beyond Coco at this point. Coco is quite old, but they have a good image data set, so it makes sense that they can have a very nice, uh, big, pre-trained, uh, general vision language model. XD Hoder exhibits strong transferability to a range of downstream tasks in both zero shot and fine tuning settings. So zero shot means you just it, like uh, you don't actually push any more gradients into the network and you just apply it directly to a different problem. And then fine tuning means you'll maybe uh, train for a couple epochs on a much smaller data set with usually a much lower learning rate. And that'll be fine tuning for a specific task. Um, open vocabulary segmentation and referring segmentation for state of the art there. Better or competitive fine tuned performance to other generalist and specialist models on segmentation and visual language tasks. Um, code, video, and demo available here. Okay, so actually they have a little website. Nice, I love these like github.io websites. Look at that. They even took the time to uh, animate the architecture diagrams. In painting, segmentation, referring segmentation. Yeah, this is really cool. I also like because it's a MIT license which is huge. MIT license, uh, you can use it for commercial use, you can use it for distribution, private use, so I think MIT license makes the world go forward. It means that if you have a startup you can use this, totally fine. If you have a, uh, if you want to do more research you can use this and just extend it, so uh, props to this team for releasing this as, as an MIT license and maybe they're continuing the tradition of the uh, Coco image data set which I think is also a very permissive license. So people at Microsoft doing it right there. Uh, this week I got Yerba Mate tea. If you guys don't know what this is you should definitely get on it. It's some of the most highly caffeinated stuff and it's also very sippable. It's popular in South America. Visual understanding at different levels of granularity have been a long standing problem. Um, you have here a description of the different tasks image text retrieval, image captioning, visual question answering, or just VQA. Pixel level grouping tasks. So these are your different types of segmentation. Instance, semantic, and panoptic segmentation. So recently most of these tasks have been separated and tackled with specialized model designs. Yeah. And you're seeing the great unification of all of these under these kind of transformer architectures with pre-trained on huge data sets and especially with the multiple modalities of image and language. What works have shown encouraging cross-task generalization capabilities most target uniform unification. I'm like just kind of readjusting my monitor here.
Yeah, pixel level annotations are costly and undoubtedly much more scarce compared to other types of annotations. That's true. Um, even just something like three, four years ago, right? You have uh, companies like Scale AI that, that do kind of data annotation. One of the things that they do, which is the most costly type of annotation, is pixel level annotation, where someone actually goes through and traces out, for example, this giraffe here, and traces out the zebra. And the amount of money that's been spent to trace out every single tree, every single road line, every single car in like these uh, autonomous vehicle data sets is huge. So being able to move away from that and not requiring that kind of uh, annotation to, to be competitive and do things like segmentation, I think is huge. It's very uh, democratizing force. Um, more importantly, not trivial to learn. Some recent efforts have attempted to bridge this. Okay, you have uh, a couple different works here. Number of works studying how to transfer or distill rich semantic knowledge from image level vision language foundation models such as clip and align. Okay, that's interesting. That's what I would have guessed they're doing here, but maybe the fact that they're saying it here means that they're not doing this. We take one step further to build a generalized decoder called X decoder. Xdecoder is built on top of a vision backbone and a transformer encoder for extracting multi-scale image features. The key novelty lies in the decoder design. It takes two sets of queries as input. Uh, generic non-semantic queries that aim to decode segmentation mask for universal segmentation. And then a newly introduced textual queries to make the decoder language aware for a diverse set of language related vision tasks. Okay, so there's two different encoders here. You're, you have your image encoder, which you can feed the image, and then your text encoder here, which you're feeding the text. Um, I'm going to guess they just use a generic pre-trained image encoder and text encoder. Pixel level masks, token level semantics. We use a single text encoder to encode the textual corpus involved in all tasks. Okay. X decoder can naturally facilitate synergy across tasks. We propose an end to end pre training method to learn from all granularities of supervision. directly groups and proposes a few meaningful segmentation candidates. Okay, so it's not, right, it's not trained on any specific category, so the masking is almost more just object-centric. It just kind of generically masks things that are similar together. And I think that's why maybe you see here in this picture here of this uh, savanna scene, right? You have some of the zebras are segmented individually, but then you also have kind of these groups of zebras that are all segmented as one. Um, so maybe that's a kind of a limitation there where individual instance segmentation is difficult. Like segmenting out these two zebras as two separate objects has always been very difficult. and. I don't know if they're necessarily trying to solve that problem because then you'd have to do more tricky stuff and they're more interested in solving a general version of this problem. Okay, so strong zero shot and task specific transferability. Pre-trained with a limited amount of segmentation data and millions Limited amount of segmentation data and millions of image text pairs. They still, they reference this twice now, but they haven't told us exactly what it is. 
model can be directly applied to all three types of segmentation tasks. When transferred to specific tasks, our model also exhibits consistent superiority to previous works. We observe some intriguing properties in our model that it can support some novel task compositions and efficient fine tuning. Okay. Pixel level image understanding. Okay, so they're reframing segmentation as pixel level image understanding. So that's just another way of saying it. I guess they're expanding the definition of it since their model is able to generalize better. So there's different types of segmentation here. They have semantic, instance, and panoptic. So semantic is more like if you're thinking in an autonomous vehicle context, you just want to know what is the road, what is the sidewalk, what is building, what is sky, right? You're just basically categorizing every pixel in the scene or in the image into one of X categories. Instance segmentation is a much is a more difficult version of that where you're now trying to say um, this is one car, this is a different car, this is a different car, right? So you're not just uh, classifying a pixel into a set of categories, but you're also you're also trying to like uh, bound individual objects within the scene. And then panoptic oh, segmentation. That combines the prediction from both instance segmentation to a general unified output. Okay, so panoptic segmentation is maybe what I was describing as instance segmentation, but it's basically the most advanced version of that, where you're not only classifying individual uh, object or classifying objects or classifying pixels, but you're also um, grouping them into instances. So semantic is the easiest, where you're just putting classifying instances, I guess, just a, the limited version of instance in this case, where you're just uh, identifying blobs that belong together, and then panoptic is the combination of classification and blob kind of identification. Semantic cares about per pixel semantic, whereas instance segmentation groups pixels of the same semantic meaning into object instances. Models for both have evolved from ConfNets into transformers, and from two-stage models to one-stage models. Yeah, so you're getting a simplification of all the kind of models in computer vision too as time goes on. Capability of per pixel and instance level understanding. Yeah, so current state of segmentation models is that they're trained for specific things such as uh, autonomous vehicles or the COCO uh, categories and then once you can uh, once you try to go beyond those categories they re can't recognize anything so they don't generalize well recently a number of works opt to transfer or distill the rich visual semantic knowledge from foundation models like CLIP to specific segmentation tasks. So you have a couple different um, works here, group transformers, VIT is the vision transformers, mask clip, and uh, these are the two data sets that they uh, are going to use to uh, uh, evaluate. I think ADE 20K is the one that they uh, advertise as state of the art here. Yeah. State of the art for panoptic instance segmentation on ADE 20K and then referring expression segmentation on ref coco G. I don't 
quite know what referring segmentation is yet. Here we go, referring segmentation. Open vocabulary in that it does not presume a fixed number of phrases in the training and inference times. Yeah, so it's basically uh, open-ended segmentation where you don't have a predefined set of categories that you've trained on and that you know your validation and test data set are limited to. This is basically, you can type any word and it'll segment out that. Since the emergence of vision transformers have cross-modal interactions from the very beginning. Uh, so here they have their data sets, uh, Rev Coco, Rev Coco Plus, and GREF. First model to tackle generic and referring segmentation tasks all in one model. Okay. Vision language pre-training has proven to be effective for various vision language tasks. Recently, researchers have found that image text data at scale can be helpful for visual representation learning. <laughs> I don't know if that's a recent. I think people always knew that the combination of image and uh, text modalities would always give more signal than just image modalities or text modalities alone. It was just that the compute budgets that people had available and the kind of scale of uh, models that people were working with made it very difficult to have multiple modalities uh, in your model and generally research was limited to like ice one modality so you were either a text person an NLP person or you were a vision person right but now with kind of the increased availability of compute and the increased availability of these large image text uh, pre-trained models such as clip everyone is kind of becoming a combination right so most machine learning people at this point can deal with the multiple modalities you don't have this kind of separation into um, different subtypes of, of uh, machine learning based on the type of data you deal with. Sorry, I should not be sniffling on the stream. That's why I have this tissue here. Although it's not actually tissues, it's toilet paper. <clears throat> okay. We are witnessing a clear trend from building specialist models to generalist ones. I agree with that. And may maybe like a meta point on this, I think that you know, as a machine learning kind of engineer, this is actually not a great trend. Because one of the things is, as software kind of advanced and uh, spread into every single nook and cranny of the, end of, of the real world, you had kind of a Cambrian explosion in the different amount of programming languages in uh, the different specializations and, and kind of uses of programming and, and kind of software really just became this huge set of diverse different things and each year that went on it got increasingly more diverse but that is not the case in machine learning what you're seeing in machine learning here is instead the opposite the more machine learning progresses it's actually unifying and consolidating so you know at, there's not going to be more machine learning jobs in the future there might actually be way less machine learning jobs in the future there's only going to be one job and it's just going to be the guy who can put who can, who can figure out how to train it on the the one super ai model on the gpus and that's going to be the only job and in fact that might probably just be done by the super ai model so kind of a little tangent point there but i think it's it's kind of it's great, but it's also sad that unlike software, machine learning is unifying as it becomes more and more powerful. Everyone uses Python. Everyone uses PyTorch. Everyone, like it's like all the things are unifying. You're not seeing a kind of explosion of different uh, software packages and niches and 
all these things. Instead, all the different niches are becoming the same thing. Recently, a number of works aim to reformulate the task. Okay, so let's look at this little figure here before we uh, go into the actual full formulation here. Okay, so you have your image fed into an image encoder. You have your image features. I assume the three different like squares here mean that they're probably doing three different sizes of images, of, of feature maps basically. So you have kind of a feature pyramid sometimes called. That's getting fed into this decoder, which I think is a transformer based on this uh, latent queries and text queries. Um, the latent queries, I'm not sure where those come from. Maybe those are uh, something specific to the task, or maybe they come from the image, we'll see. But the text goes in as well, and then the decoder kind of com combines all of that, gives you the outputs, and then gives you the pixel level outputs. And there's two different outputs there, right? That's kind of what they were saying that up here, that they, the kind of inputs and outputs to this system and this architecture diagram, they're designed in such a way that you can very quickly kind of reformulate it and create a bunch of different tasks, right? Like if you think of, for example, the this bounding box detection here with these little cute owls, uh, bounding box models used to output like very specific things like the the position of the bounding box, right? But then at that point your model's kind of like hard-coded to only output the position of bounding boxes. So by having kind of more generic outputs such as pixel level outputs and then semantic outputs, you can kind of then repurpose this same model for a variety of different tasks. Um, okay. Let's get into this uh, math here. So you have an input image, capital I, uh, which is in the real set. This is a set, so it's part of all the real numbers of, this is the dimensionality here. You have height, uh, width, and then three, because images, right, have a, a red, green, and blue channel. So there's the size of the image, height and width, and then there's the three channels, and that's uh, what your input image is. Then you have an input, input image encoder, encoder I, right? I'm assuming that that's just going to be some pre-trained encoder. And then they ultimately extract features Z from that. So you feed your image into your encoder and you get a vector, or in this case, it'll be a tensor because it's 2D or 3D actually, uh, Z. Afterwards, we use the text encoder encoder T, so they have encoder image and then encoder text. To encode a textual query T, oh shit, a textual query T into QT. Okay, so they take the text that you feed into the text encoder and it outputs a set of text queries, Q1T, Q2T all the way to QNT, where you have N of these, right? Um, the visual features, textual queries, and the M non-semantic or latent queries, QH. So you also have, um, you have N text queries, and then M of these uh, latent queries are fed into the X decoder to predict the output. We still don't know what these latent queries are. I'm assuming they're, I'm guessing they're text, but they still haven't told us. So OP and OS are the pixel level masks and token level semantics, respectively. Okay, so here you have the decoder model, X decoder. You have QH, your latent queries, QT, your text queries, and then Z, which is your image encoded into features. And the output of that is going to be the pixel level masks, OP, and the token level semantics, OS. Okay. This is basically just a this image, but in math. But we still need more information on what these things actually are. We define two types of queries and outputs. The queries for the decoder are categorized into latent queries and text queries. Latent queries and text queries. 
which undertake generic vision and language tasks, respectively, and their combinations can further support various blah blah blah. Okay. Likewise, the output is categorized into pixel level masks and semantic embedding. Okay, I wish they would kind of <laughs> define what these are rather than just kind of repeating over and over again what these are. Um, we employ a single text encoder, encoder T. We reformulate the mask in segmentation into a mask text, yeah. Matching problem between O of S and the textual embeddings of prompted textual concepts. Yeah, so this is how they're doing the kind of generic is that the the model the the masking right the segmentation is done independent of the categories it just kind of blobs together things and then the the actual decoder is looking at the text embeddings that it's received and it's saying okay what what uh blobs within this image or within within this feature map right because the image is encoded are more most similar to this particular text blo this uh text embedding so it's really just uh doing kind of this one-to-one -one matching problem. I'm kind of excited to try that out. I think once we finish the paper, I want to try out, uh, I have some pictures of, of Boo here. Let me actually do that while we're here. So this is uh, my cat, Boo. And let's do open vocabulary instance segmentation. Um, Owl. Let's do cat. Uh, format YYY. Let's see. Ha! There you go. Look at that. <laughs> Let's do cat teapot. Didn't get the teapot. Open vocabulary semantic segmentation. I think that's more what we want. Open vocabulary semantic segmentation, and we want cat teapot electric plug. Okay, so the entire house is the electric plug, the teapot, and then the cat. Let's get rid of electric plug and just do this. Okay, so this is also uh, semantic segmentation, right? So it's no longer instant segmentation. It's not giving you a clean mask. It's just uh, saying every single pixel in this image, what category does it belong to? So it's actually quite not quite good. Let's go back to instance segmentation here. Yeah, it's not getting the the teapot. Uh, what if we do kettle? I think that's a, another word for teapot. No, it's still not getting it. Maybe you need to do x, x, x. Like, what is this x, 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 y, y, y thing? Yeah, there you go. Cat and kettle. Cat, kettle, let's see if it says, uh, electric. No, it doesn't get it. It's quite good though. You always want to test it with cats. All right, let's go back here to the paper. So we fully decoupled the image and text encoder in every previous unified encoder decoder models. The image and text are fused together on the encoder side. In contrast, by fully decoupling the image and text encoder, X decoder can learn from both intra image supervision and inter image ones. Based on the above designs, X decoder can be used to seamlessly unify different vision and language tasks.
Okay. So here I think they're going to define what each of these things are for the different tasks. These terms that we saw. So the first task that they have here is generic segmentation. So the decoder only receives the uh, QH, which is the latent queries. Uh, Z, which is the image encoded into a feature map. And then you have the O and P and O and S. Okay, so I think the the QH is this stuff here. It's this 3x. So it's kind of like a, a way to describe. Yeah, I think the Q the Q uh, T is the text embedding. So it's like this stuff here, this this column here, and the Q H what they're calling the latent embedding is this stuff here, this task description, right? And I'm guessing that's the uh, case here because they say O P and O S have the same size of Q H. So I guess what they're saying here is that basically by saying x, 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 you're basically saying I want three things. Okay, requires both latent and text queries as inputs and thus shares the same formula. We only use the first M decoded outputs corresponding to the latent queries. Okay, image text retrieval. We only feed the latent decoder, blah, blah, blah. And then the last mth token is used to compute similarities between images and texts. So you can actually use uh, clip or any kind of uh, language image uh, model to, to do image, te or image text retrieval. So if you have a ton of images, and you want to figure out which images have people in them or which images have dogs in them, you can basically just type dog into clip, get that embedding vector, and then compare that embedding vector to the embedding vector of every single image in your database. And then you can very quickly search your database with uh, text. It's quite powerful if you guys haven't done that. Okay. For both tasks, S decoder takes us both latent and text queries and decodes the outputs. Uh, BQA is visual question answering. No masks are predicted. The caption prediction follows a causal masking strategy while visual question answering does not. The adaptation of our X decoder to each task is further depicted in figure three. Okay, so this is how they kind of rewire the model depending on the uh, task here. So in generic segmentation, the text actually doesn't get fed to the decoder. Basically, you put the text into the encoder and then you compare the uh, embedding vectors, right, the, the latent text vectors to the semantic outputs of the decoder. So basically, in generic segmentation, the, the image is getting turned into a bunch of features and then those features are getting masks. So the model's saying, okay, there's a blob here, there's a blob here, and there's a blob here. And it says, this is what these little blobs are to me. And then uh, we're comparing the, the, the text vectors to those blob vectors. And we're saying, okay, okay, we have these three text vectors that we want, such as owl and grass. Of the blobs that you were able to mask out, which ones of these are closest to owl and which ones of these are closest to grass? And that's how the generic segmentation happens. Referring segmentation is very similar, except you're, you are feeding the text into the decoder. 
image text retrieval again it's the same thing you're not actually feeding the text here but you're getting the you're comparing the the text vectors to the output the semantic outputs which are also kind of text vectors if you want to think of them that way at least they're in the same embedding space or they're trained to be so that they are and then image captioning vqa in this case you don't have um the pixel level outputs although realistically they you probably do right you just don't do anything with them We advocate for the unification by functionality rather than interface. We maximally share the common parts of different tasks while keeping the remaining unchanged for individual tasks. Um, yeah, I generally agree with that. Okay, unified architecture. So they're basing this on this model here, mask two former, which I assume is probably just an earlier uh, work by this research group. So they have their uh, image, which they, again, we described it earlier. We extract hierarchical visual features from L layers. So this is the kind of feature pyramid that I was talking about where uh, they're not just using the last, right? If you, if you want to think of the image encoder as just like a, a, a bunch of layers of neurons, right? They're not just using the last one. They're also using um, uh, features at different parts of that image encoder, right? Different resolutions. You have some of the features are, are much smaller dimensional and they're going to be more high level. And then you're going to have uh, wider uh, features, bigger features that are kind of lower in the stack that are more uh, high frequency data like textures and stuff like that. And for a segmentation task, the lower layers are actually more important, right? Because a lot of segmentation is just, is like texture difference. It's like the the way that you know that this owl is different from the grass is that because the, the kind of like, if you zoom in, the texture of the grass is very different from the texture of the owl. And if you go to the very last layer of an image encoder, it's kind of, it's lost that that texture and kind of like high resolution knowledge at that point the the last layers of the image encoder really what they're encoding is that this is a picture with owls in it right it's kind of like high level information so as you go up and down the stack of that image encoder the the kind of type of information that's in those feature maps is different okay so right the latent z is uh, the result of feeding the image into this encoder i um, and Z itself is really uh, a set of L, capital L, uh, feature maps where each individual feature map, lowercase c, lowercase l, has um, a different height, different width, and a different depth, right? Uh, where the height and width are going to be smaller than the original height and width of the image. Uh, and then, sorry, this is the wrong color. This should be green. And then uh, D is the feature dimension, right? So when you're encoding images, right, the original image has three channels, so it's height by width by three. But then as soon as you basically go one level deep, the, the, cha the, the three, the channel, is actually going to increase very, very quickly, right? So, and by the time you get to the very last layer, it's actually going to be that feature map is going to have m much more the D dimension is actually gonna be much higher than the height and the width probably, right? You might have like a 28 by 28 by 256. So there's, there's like way more in that depth dimension. Pixel level understanding at different scales, okay. Okay, one decoder for all tasks. 
uses a stack of transformer layers to refine the queries and render the input outputs. Okay, so it has a cross attention mechanism and then it has a self attention mechanism here. So these are different types of attention mechanisms. Um, cross attention here, your uh, QL minus one and QL minus one. So this is like at different layers. So different layers and then you have the text queries and you have the uh, latent queries. Here you have the same one, latent queries and text queries except these are hat, right? Q hat here, and then here it's Q not hat. So we let all queries cross attend the visual features. For latent queries, we use masked cross attention mechanism and a full attention for the textual queries. We use the last latent query to extract the global image representation and the remaining for generic segmentation. For image captioning, each textual query can attend itself, its predecessors, and all latent queries. Okay, so they're doing some kind of masking here, right? They're saying cross attention is all about this masking. So depending on the task you don't want every single kind of uh, input here the the text the latent queries and the image features you don't want some of them to kind of pay attention to if, if you want to pay attention to in this case right in these attention mechanisms it just means multiplies right you're multiplying vectors with other vectors and uh, if things are related you're going to have a high you're going to have a larger activation versus a smaller activation but you can mask that and say, I'm only going to allow certain parts to pay attention to certain other parts, right? And that's what they're doing here in this figure four they're showing you. So, ooh, zoom in there. Ooh, so, interaction amongst latent queries, green. Right, right, we got a. We have a typo here we are the typo machines let's uh, copy that let's go here let's uh, make an issue new issue typo in paper In figure four, there is a typo in the word green. Great work, team. Let's uh, submit this issue. Okay. Uh, between latent and text queries for generic segmentation and image text retrieval. Okay, so you have here segment, segmentation and text retrieval. You have your latent queries green. And I don't know what this like circle versus square is. The square latent query is designated for image text retrieval. Okay, I'm not sure what they mean by the square and the circle here. I don't know what they're trying to like explain. But ultimately what you see here is that some of these are kind of zeroed out. I think that's what this like dotted white means is that basically that's not being calculated. So here in image captioning, right? You have the green, which is the latent query. You have the yellow, which is the text latent. So yellow is the text, right? Yellow pays attention to latent here, right? So this is multiplying this, this is multiplying this, this is multiplying this, and so on. But it is not 
uh, paying attention to itself here, right? So this yellow here is not paying attention to this yellow here. So I still don't know exactly what the squares and circles there mean, but. Decoder always produces masks only for the M latent queries. Okay. So these are the different masks. Right, so there's going to be M of them. So however many latent queries you have is however many masks you have. So I think here, right, uh, Y, Y, Y. You're going to have three different masks. And I wonder what happens if we do this. Do we just get one? What happens if we put more? Hmm. Confusing. But either way, like a uh, mask for a segmentation is just going to be uh, zero and one, where right zero means not part of this object, one means part of this object, so for every pixel in that mask, you're basically saying, is this part of the owl or is this not part of the owl? And that's, that's what a mask would look like. And here predicts the outputs, the semantic outputs, O semantic, which is, you could think of it as like the text output, is going to be m plus n and the dimensionality of that is going to be d where d is the, just the size of the uh, semantic output that I don't they should have picked something other than d there right because they already said that d is the uh, when they were describing the image encoder that d is the size of the kind of feature dimension and this is the size, this is the text output. So the, so the semantic output is basically a, an embedding that represents the text. That's gonna have probably a different dimensionality than the uh, depth of the feature map, which comes out of the image encoder. But maybe they're both the same as that's why they, and that's why they picked D, but to me, those would be two separate numbers, two separate hyperparameters that you could tune. We apply causal masking to ensure the outputs are compatible for segmentation. We follow 64 to convert a class name into a phrase with a text prompt. Uh, okay. Um, so they are using an off the shelf tokenizer here. So they probably are using an off the shelf image or er, text encoder as well. Or not, maybe end-to-end -end pre training here. I wonder if this extends to the uh, image encoder and the text encoder. Okay, they're using a language image contrastive loss. This is the same loss that uh, Clip is trained on. We take the last valid token feature of the uh, text uh, query here to represent a text as QT and take the last entry in the object to represent it uh, the semantic as OS. So again, in many of these here, right, they're, they're comparing the output of this text encoder to the semantic output. So these need to be kind of comparable. You need to be able to kind of uh, compare these. So the individual output, uh, semantic output vector has to be comparable with the individual encoded text vector. Um, so they, here you go, you have a batch of these. Uh, 
where B is the total number of image text pairs in your batch. So then they do the dot product between these to obtain an affinity matrix. Okay, which you could just think of it like the more those vectors are, right, you have this little vector Q, Q hat T and you have this little vector O hat S and the mo more those are kind of pointing in the same direction and in alignment, the dot product is gonna be much higher. If those vectors are pointing in separate directions, the dot product is gonna be very small, closer to zero. So that affinity matrix roughly tells you how uh, in alignment those little vectors are, right? And for the language image contrastive loss that they're using here, ultimately what they're trying to do is get those more in alignment, like text that is corresponds to a certain image, should those dot products should be uh, high, right? Closer to one, right? Closer to being right on top of each other. And text and image that is separate from each other or different should be zero. It should be kind of, maybe not zero, but lower. Uh, and CE here is the cross entropy loss. Okay, so for mass classification, we encode all C class names, including background, into C text queries and take the last valid token feature from each to represent the token or to represent the concept. Afterwards, we take the decoder outputs corresponding to the first M minus one latent queries and compute the dot product between these outputs and concept embeddings to obtain the affinity matrix, okay? So here you have the uh, class affinity matrix and compute the loss L class with the ground truth class. So the data sets they are using, they are using data sets for this that are class data sets. I'm, I'm sure they'll say it, but I, I can almost guarantee you it's probably Coco. Yeah, here it is. <laughs> I like looked ahead. Um, for panoptic and referring segmentation, we use Coco 2017 um, with segmentation annotations and exclude the validation sets of Coco Carpathi. So 104K images and then 30K images. Yeah, so segmentation paper coming out of Microsoft, you can bet your ass they're going to be using Coco. For image captioning, we extract the embeddings from all tokens of the vocabulary size V. Right, so when you encode text into tokens, there's a limited vocabulary size. Right, the space of that is quantized. In the last end semantics, we can compute the dot product with all token embeddings to obtain another affinity matrix here and then they have the cross entropy loss between the ground truth next token ID. Okay, and now the mask loss. So given the predictions, you have the uh, pixel predictions, which you could think of as the image output, and then the semantic predictions, which you could think of as the text output derived from the M latent queries, they use Hungarian matching to find the matched entries of the first M minus one outputs. Afterwards, we follow 12 to use binary cross entropy loss and dice loss. So dice loss here, Hungarian matching, it's just, some, it's like a way of basically, you have your mask, right? Because here they're training with ground truth mask, and then you have the mask that comes out of your model, and then you basically, there's a loss to that. And you can't just like do mean squared error, right? So there's like some clever way to get a loss from a predicted mask and a real mask. 
and there's probably there's like a hundred different ways to do that, but here they're using Hungarian matching and dice loss. Okay, experimental setup here. So, synoptic segmentation, image text pairs, and referring. Okay, for image text pairs, we use the standard 4M corpora, which includes these different data sets here. Conceptual captions, SBU captions, visual genome, and COCO captions. So this is, there's two different parts here. There's the captioning uh, data set, which I think is here in this part here, this loss, L captioning. And then you have the segmentation data set which is here, uh, L class, right? So segmentation and class. And then the, because you also have segment, the dice loss is also using the segmentation data set. So there's different data sets for different learning objectives and they're pushing all of those gradients into the same model. I wonder if they do it all at the same time or whether they alternate, be curious, let's see. Our visual decoder follows to use 100 latent queries and 9 decoder layers, and we add one additional latent query for image level tasks. Okay, so 100 latent queries and 9 decoder layers. We adopt focal T and David BL as the vision text and a transformer text encoder with causal masking. Why do they not tell you what this transformer text encoder is? Just tell us what it is. Is it like some Microsoft secret? Uh, during pre-training, we set the mini batch to 32 and image text pairs to 1024. Image resolution is set to 1024 for segmentation and 224 for image text data. This is quite big. 1024 is not small. Like they probably have a big GPU for that. We pre-train all models for 50 epochs using Adam W as the optimizer. Without any architecture change except adding a head for VQA, we directly fine tune to demonstrate the task transfer capability. Okay, most notably, our 25 epoch fine tuned establishes a new state of the art on the ADE 20K dataset. On Coco, our model attains comparable performance. Yeah, and impressively here, it's like they're, the way they say it here, our tiny model already outperforms. So on these benchmarks that they're trying, these aren't like new benchmarks, right? Sometimes like in these papers, they'll just come up with some new benchmark and they'll be like, oh, we got state of the art on this benchmark, but nobody else has even tried that. But these benchmarks that they're trying are relative, they're older, right? So there's a kind of a wealth of literature and previous work that has established kind of hard to beat baselines on those benchmarks especially when you have um when you're competing against a bunch of very specialized like hard-coded architectures only that are only uh designed for that very specific problem because here again they're, they're using one architecture one kind of uh system to do all these different tasks and it's not even that big of a of a network there so like the fact that with their smaller model that is kind of by design more generalized the fact that it can beat kind of these specialized models on these benchmarks is impressive. Or maybe not beat, but like come very close.
All right, so you have here, let's look at this. They have three different sizes here, tiny, big, and then large. So kind of the difference here, you can see in generic segmentation between the small one is like 41 versus 49. So you're roughly getting like a 10% improvement in performance here. Image retrieval, another 10. Captioning, and then VQA. This is very good though, right? Even their tiny model is doing as good as kind of the previous state of the art here. And again, why all these dashes are because the, these models aren't designed for these things, right? Like, so this model here, Uniter, is only capable of doing these tasks here. Re image retrieval, captioning, and VQA. It has, there's no way to evaluate it on these. So part of the impressive thing here is that not only are these results competitive across all these different categories, all these different tasks, but it's also the only model that can do all of them, right? So that's part of the impressiveness of this uh, table as well. They have a bunch of crap here. This is just m more comparing. This is a mean IOU intersection over union, uh, mean average precision. Um, these are just different uh, metrics, and then these are different uh, data sets. So sun is the, uh, I think, rooms. Cityscapes is more of a autonomous vehicle data set. Bleu is actually a language uh, benchmark. Okay, interesting. They compare it to this other one here, Glip, which maybe is like a variant, like something that uses Clip. And Glip uses over 10 million pre-training data, including around 2 million with box supervision. And despite the huge gap in pre-training data, X Decoder outperforms Glip on both captioning and VQA. So one of the reasons, like part of the reason that multiple input modalities are kind of becoming the standard now is that there's more signal in that, right? So training on text and images together gives you a better result than training only on text and training only on images. And even this, um, I'm, I don't know exactly what GLIP is, but like I'm assuming that GLIP has trained on this 10 million uh, and this 10 million data set and this 2 million data set, that might only be limited to images. So you can see how a smaller data set that has both text and image is actually more powerful than a larger data set that's just image. Uh, zero shot, so this is just without any change in this model weights, no fine tuning. Okay, so they have two different types here. So they have X decoder seg, 
And then they have X decoder seg plus, where we take the heuristic way to extract noun phrases from Google captions and use them as extra supervision. So this is kind of cool. Like within the computer vision world, there's always been kind of a way to do uh, image augmentation, right? So uh, let's get an image. Image augmentation is, okay, you have this picture of a cat and when I'm training, let me actually augment it in a bunch of different ways. So I'm gonna feed this to my model and I'm gonna say, this is a cat. And then I'm also gonna say, this picture of the cat but flipped is also a cat. This picture of the cat but rotated is also a cat and so on. And you can create a lot more data from just a smaller, from one image you can actually create basically infinite images that allow you to kind of improve, like increase the size of your data set. And the thing is you can also do that with uh, text, right? So you can take this image and then there's a corresponding uh, text that says cat. You can now say uh, image of a cat, uh, cat in an image, right? Like you can basically come up with a, a bunch of different variants of the word phrase. The way they say it here is that noun phrases. And then that's basically analogous to kind of augmentation in the image space. Here you're augmenting in the uh, word space, which is, I think, pretty cool. Damn, dude, this paper is a beast. So much stuff here. So much data. New state of the art on ten seconds. Like this, this model is killing it. Like. You know, there's a lot of tables in here, a lot of numbers, a lot of benchmarks, but power to them because they're actually performing extremely well on all these benchmarks. Our X decoder promotes harmony of generative and co contrastive learning. Query interactions. The interaction among tasks is highly dependent on the interaction between latent and text queries. We investigate how our model behaves with different interactions, so a little ablation study here. Image captioning requires both fine-grained and global image information. So this is the... Uh, the justification for the like kind of feature pyramid, I think having uh, image features from different levels of the image encoder. Language condition is important for referring segmentation. This is a badass picture. The, the giraffe is playing with the lion. I don't think that's what this picture is. I think this is a giraffe like karate chopping and killing a lion. I didn't know giraffes did that. That's pretty metal. Okay. Decreasing vision 
language batch size, Hertz vision language tasks, and open vocab segmentation performance. So bigger batch sizes, right, smooth out your training and uh, kind of a, a learning, a generic kind of uh, bag of trick best practice is uh, don't decrease the learning rate, increase the batch size. And there's, a, there's a famous paper that argues for the reasoning for that. Sure, a model can perform region-based retrieval. So this is NSF grant, uh, the Korean government. So basically a bunch of government money here. Although I guess Microsoft probably paid for the actual compute. I wonder if in the appendix they tell us what they used for the text embedding model. Where is it? Where is it? Damn, dude, they didn't find it. Okay, let's try to end this with something cool here. Let's do the uh, referring editing. So let's see the example they have for this. Referring editing, the green apple. This one here. So X decoder text, um, we're gonna add um, we're going to put our little cat here, and we're going to say the cat, and we want to turn it into uh, the orange cat, and uh, we white cat, and then we want to turn it into an orange cat. Uh, and then we'll just leave that there. And let's see what we get. Ha! <laughs> it just got rid of it. Like, <laughs> there's no more cat. Um, Why does this not? What is segmentation really? I can't see the uh, chat for some reason. It's not showing up. M9. Segmentation is just kind of one to one. It's this right here. It's like creating these masks. The green apple, let's...
Why does it not? In their example, it changes the green apple to a red apple. A, the white cat. And I want a, an orange cat. Come on, give me a different colored cat. Maybe we can use tiger. Yeah, it just doesn't want to do that. A tiger. You know, that's, I don't know, it's good, you know? It just replaced this cat with this cat, with this tiger. It's a little weird. Let's try a different image here. I have this image. A uh, cat, tiger. See what we get here. Nothing, it's just erased the face. It's interesting how it hallucinated an extra leaf there. See, so like there's there's nothing here, and then suddenly like it just imagines this leaf. And this like leaf right here. Um, let's do plant, uh, and then fireworks. See if we can replace the plant with fireworks. Okay, got rid of plant. I don't know what that is. Could maybe see fireworks, but I don't know, maybe like an actual like firework firework. Um All right, let's try one more and then we'll end it here. Uh kitchen and let's do uh space. So hopefully it segments out the kitchen with, and it replaces it with space. Okay. Yeah, just more morphing. So, I don't know, I, I guess that the, the model that they're using here in this demo is probably the smaller one. Right, they have three different sizes here. Um, they have, let me go to this table here. Yeah, they have X decoder T, B, and L. I doubt that for the kind of public demo they're using L. That would just be too expensive. They're probably using just the the small model. So the small model's probably just not as good and limited. But this is kind of interesting. And it's a very powerful model. And it's MIT licensed, so. Yeah, this is huge. Like, I'm definitely going to be using this in projects moving forward just for the simplicity of it. And segmentation generally sucks. I think before this I would have used Detectron 2, but the uh, this one seems better than that. Um, cool. Thanks for listening, guys. Um, like and subscribe as always. And, yeah, see you guys tomorrow for another interesting stream.